It's really nice to give this talk. And I, I was thinking, actually, because I gave a talk previously at the Royal Institution, and to stand there in that historical lecture theatre was a really big sort of, there was a very intimate connection you had with the audience and also to stand where all of these famous scientists have presented and argued about the work that they've done, mathematicians and scientists, that was really special. But I also thought that there's a certain advantage in doing it this way because what you get to do when you come and watch this sort of talk and I know I've also got my, uh, a lot of my family are watching, hopefully my wife and kids are watching and my mum and dad. It's a much more sort of intimate thing where you get to come, it's a bit late, it's much later than I'm usually at the office. But this is uh, my office in Uppsala. I've just moved into this office. Uh, well, I moved in a few months before Corona started and so I haven't been around here so much. But this is actually where I work and this is where I do the things I do. I sit often, angled in this direction, um, writing on my computer, maybe writing some code or writing a book. Or, and I also sit maybe looking down like this, making some calculations. I've got my bookshelf in the, in the background there. And this is also where I meet students and various people who want to come and speak to me. And I think it's nice for you to get a feeling for where I do the work and where a mathematician does the work and, and, and how it looks. And my book is, is called The Ten Equations. And it's also a sort of personal look into how I think as a mathematician. And the title, The Ten Equations That Rule the World, is kind of double because this, and, and the first part is there are equations which are used in all sorts of parts of society. But then also there's this idea about how you can use them too, how you can take that type of mathematics that applied mathematicians do and put it into your life. So I'm gonna to come to the equations and how you can use them in a bit, but what I actually want to start with is something slightly different. I'm going to put up a picture now, and I think in the chat, I'd appreciate if you, um, if anyone knows what this picture is, they could write into the um, chat exactly what this, uh, this picture represents. It's, um, uh, widely spread and it's used quite a lot on the internet um, more recently, but it's also got a historical past and it's uh, got an historical past that goes back actually to the time of the, um, the Royal Institution as well, to the 1700s. So um, now we'll see if the, the chat is working, if I get any answers. So any, does anyone know what this picture represents? Well, OK, I haven't got any answers, but I'll, I'll assume that a few people are um, typing in the words Illuminati just now. So Illuminati is, uh, represent, represents a sort of secret society and a conspiracy theory where a small group of individuals control the world. And they do it behind, they, they enter financial institutions, they enter politics, and they enter different parts of public life and they have some control over what's happening according to their own agenda, which we're somewhere what we're unaware of. So it's a, a secret society and it has a historical basis as well. There was a real Illuminati society uh, one time and this was in the 1700s in Bavaria and it's died out. And I can assure you there is no real Illuminati society now. There is no Illuminati that controls the world. So it's not Illuminati confirmed. But I do think it's a fascinating idea when we start to think about mathematics. I think what we can think of is there, there isn't an Illuminati, but is there a secret society that controls the world? And could it be run by mathematicians? So there is one suggestion in fiction of this type of thing. And that's the book, The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. Now, when I read this book, I think it's almost 20 years ago I read it now, I found it really exciting actually, especially the first 100 pages, because what it proposes is that there's a secret society, they're called the Priory of Sion, and they control the world using, in part, the number phi, and phi is equal to one plus the square root of five divided by two, or 1.618. And they use the number phi as a sort of code 
to talk to each other, but they also see it as a building block to the world. So phi does occur in lots of mathematics. It, can, it, it comes up quite a few times in different parts of geometry. It is also, if you have a Fibonacci sequence, which is one, one, two, three, five, eight, and so on, the ratio of two numbers in the Fibonacci sequence tend towards phi, the golden ratio. So it occurs in lots of different places. And Dan Brown builds it up, and he builds it up in a totally exaggerated way. He goes a little bit past what phi really does. But he brings up this idea that there could be a secret mathematical code behind everything we do. So I'm not going to say that this is true, but I'm going to use that as a background in order to think about my approach and how I've been thinking about mathematics. And I'm just going to change focus now. I'm going to change focus to an, another two people here who were looking for mathematical secrets. So this is Jan and Marius. These two guys are setting off into a career in professional gambling. And I met them because they contacted me. I, I do research in lots of different areas. And one thing I've been quite interested in is gambling and the mathematics behind gambling. I'm not a big gambler myself, and I'm probably going to explain why later. But I'm interested in how mathematics can be used in, um, to win money by betting. And so these two guys, they searched me out because they wanted to find out as much as they could about the mathematics behind um, gambling. And they came and visited Uppsala, where I'm based, just before the uh, World Cup in 2018. And they, um, we, what we decided to do in order to kind of start working together on this, we started working on a betting model for the World Cup. Um, to see if we could find biases in the odds which would allow us to make some money. And quite soon after Jan um, and Marius arrived, Jan started downloading the different odds and we started working on this model. And it took us about, I don't know, it took us about a day to produce a model which could automatically place bets on every match in the upcoming World Cup. I'm going to tell you how it went for the model in a little bit, but first I think I need to tell, I need to um, just give you a little bit of insight into how the mathematics of gambling work. So I'll start with the following problem. You can answer this in the poll. If you go into the polls you've got there, um, and the first poll has just come up now, it's, is, you, uh, um, is the following a good bet? I'll explain a little bit better about gambling for those of you who don't gamble. I hope a lot of you don't. Um, you're offered odds of three to two for England winning against Denmark. England are playing against Denmark um, tomorrow night. So you're offered odds of three to two. Now, what odds of three to two means that if you place a two pound bet, it will give a three pound profit if England win, and it will give a two pound loss if they don't win. Then the question is, if the probability that England win is one in three, is this a good bet? Should you take this bet that you've been offered? I can see lots of answers starting to come in already now. That's really nice. Good. And I think it's tending towards the, the right one. I'm glad there's quite a few don't knows in there because um, I don't want to be too certain. But now it's coming up to the right answer. Great. I've got a really good mathematical audience tonight, it seems. And the answer is no. No, it's not a good bet. And here's why. The expected profit for this bet is... One th so f first of all, you can look at what you get if you win, and that's one third times. So if you win, you get three, three pounds. And the probability you win is one third. So one third times three is one. And if you lose, you lose two pounds. And two thirds times two is equal to four thirds. So overall, you're going to lose 33 pence on average with this bet. So no, it's not a good bet. What about this one then? Uh, you can also go into the poll and answer this one. If the probability that England win is one in two, is this a good bet? What do you think? So we've only got one no so far. Great, so that's going up and down a little bit now. And um, you're going for yes. Of course, I hope that, that maybe the people who are saying no are thinking that you should never gamble. Um, so uh, they're, they're thinking that way. But the answer is um, yes, this is a good bet. Because the expected profit now is, um, again, you can win three pounds. 
And half of the time you'll win three pounds and half of the time you'll lose two pounds. So on average, you'll win 50 pence on this bet. So nice to see 75% of you got that one right. Okay, so let's just have a little bit of a different question now because um, contrary to some some beliefs, mathematics is very seldom about numbers. As soon, as soon mathematics is nearly always about going away from numbers towards letters because that's when you really know what you're you're calculating. So we'll start by doing this by thinking about a fair bet. A fair bet is when the expected profit is zero for both you and the bookmaker. So that's when you expect, given the probability of a result, that neither of you will make a profit if England play Denmark an infinite amount, number of times. Of course, England aren't going to play Denmark an infinite number of times in the same way. But if they were and they played that infinite number of times, your expected profit should be zero. OK, so what's the uh, what's a fair bet? Well, let's also say that and this is what I say about going towards letters. I've replaced the probability of one third and a half with a P. So if the probability that England win is P, then the expected profit is, well, it's three times P if you win, and then it's minus two times one minus P. So the probabilities have to add up to one. Of course, in a football match, as you know, you can win, lose, and draw. So all the losers and draws are here, and you have two times one minus P. And that ends up being five times P, um, because you have the 3p here, you have the minus 2 minus p there, so 5p minus 2. So that's the expected profit. And from there, we can work out the fair bet. Because in this case, the expected profit is 0 when 5p minus 2 is equal to 0, or when p is equal to 2, two fifths. That is a fair bet. And we know that from the questions we looked up up to, up to now, because one third is less than two fifths. One third is equal to two over six, so it's less than two over five. And one half is more than two fifths. So that fair bet is between those two levels and the level turns out to be two fifths. So that's very nice. But we're not, as mathematicians, we're not satisfied yet because we've still got some numbers in our equation. We want rid of all the numbers. And what we do here is we have the more general equation. So. In general, if the odds are X for the favorite winning, then for a one pound bet, the expected profit as follows. So the equation is exactly the same as we've, we've looked up up to now. We've got P is the probability of winning, X is the profit, minus one is the loss if you lose the bet, and one minus P is the probability of losing the bet. And we can now find out the expected profit. Well, there's a little bit of algebra here where you have to go through, through a few steps. But if we rearrange this equation, this original equation here, we get the following equation. We get the equation here at the bottom, which is P equals 1 over 1 plus X. Um, and can I just ask a, a, a question here? When I put my mouse over these things, does anybody see my mouse coming over these things? Unfortunately oh. not. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> these things with my mouse and you can't uh, you can't see what I'm I'm saying okay so I'll, I'll, it's good it's good you say that so I'll um I'll, I'll be clear what I'm indicating um the, I've solved this equation and it's the bottom equation is what I finally come up to so my probability of um the probability of the team winning is it when it's equal to one over one plus x it's a fair bet and we'll plot this now so this is now a plot of the equation P equals one over one plus X. And if you look on the left-hand side, so the X axis here is the bookmaker's odds. That's the X, that's the um, profit you'll get if you win your bet. And the Y axis is the probability of the favorite winning or the frequency of winning. And when the odds are one to 10, that's very um, short odds, then the probability of winning is slightly over 90%. And when the odds are one to one or two to one to one, the probability of winning is a half, two to one, the probability of winning is a third. And Marius and Jan, as I say above there, they don't care about fair bets or they only care about fair bets because they want to find um, cases where they can find an unfair bet and they want to find an unfair bet in their advantage. And to solve this problem, what they need is data. We've got our equation, we've got our model. What we need now is data. And this is 
to illustrate this, this is some data I've made to illustrate this point. This is what some data might look like. And we collected data for the um, uh, for previous big tournaments, Euro 2016. This is what Jan downloaded. Euro 2012, the World Cup in Brazil. And the data looks something like this. The, now we actually have frequency of wins for different bookmakers odds, as shown as the dots. And what we can do is we can compare the data with the um, theoretical curve. And what we find is the the bookmakers odds differ from the theoretical curve in two ways. They slightly underestimate the favor, favorites when they have shorter odds and they overestimate the favorites when we have longer odds. And this is where we can start to see that we've got an edge. This is where Jan and Marius get very excited because when the odds are very short, it says it's actually worth backing the favorite. This is called a long shot bias. When people are betting on the World Cup, they often bet on long favorites because if they win, they win a lot of money. And that means that you can make a profit by uh, backing the favorite. It will be a small profit, but it's still an edge that's there for you. And also another thing they found, we found is that um, they overestimate favorites with longer odds. And those are those points down on the right hand side that I've indicated. And this gives us a betting strategy. Oh, what did I say? I'm now going to give you the most complicated equation we're going to have in the, in the whole talk. I've thrown in most of the maths at the start of this talk because um, I think that you might get tired later on. This is the most complicated equation we're going to look at. And this is equation one of my 10 equations. And what it says is, OK, if I look at the previous one, this line um, through the data is uh, doesn't match perfectly. But can I find a line that goes through this data and matches perfectly? And the answer is I can if I stretch it a bit. And what I've done to stretch the line, I've introduced these two parameters called alpha and beta. And what they do is if when alpha and beta are one, then we just go back to one over one plus x. But if alpha and beta have any other value than one, they stretch these curves in various different ways. And so I can stretch the theoretical curve to get closer to the data. And that's exactly what we do using a method called logistic regression. We stretch this curve so that um, it's now much closer to the data points. And you see I've chosen alpha equals 1.16 and beta equals 1.25. And this equation better predicts previous matches than the bookmaker's odds. And this is exactly what Marius and Jan are after. This is the equation that can make money on the World Cup if this World Cup, the 2018 World Cup, follows a similar pattern to tournaments before it. Um, I don't think I want to go too much. I don't think I've made my point about this, but this is just to put it in numbers as well. I've taken another England match here, England-Uruguay. This table gives you an idea. Well, I think the main point I want to make about it is this is what the bookmakers predict. Oh, yeah, you can't see my arrow. The bookmaker, if you look at the England-Uruguay column uh, row, then the bookmakers predict 51% chance of England winning. Our model predicts a 48% chance of England winning. So you see that it's a tiny, tiny edge there that we have over the bookmakers, but it's enough that 3% difference to hopefully make some money uh, um, at the bookmakers. Now, and that's, that's the point here, the model gives a small edge. And we did okay, actually. Um, Jan and Marius and I, I mean, it was just once, once Jan has set this thing up, and this is the, this is the idea here, is that it's just a license to print money in a way that he set up the algorithm. I could go away and enjoy the World Cup matches, not actually knowing which, which teams our algorithm had bet on. And we made 200 pounds at the end from 1,400 pounds worth of bets. I do want to say that there was some luck involved in this because it made more than the model predicted. And we could have easily lost money because it's not enough bets. You actually have to make a lot of bets before you know that your model really is working. But it did happen to work out in this particular case. But the most interesting story for me was during two, I met up with these guys in 2018. During 2019, they put these types of methods into action and it went very well for Marius and Jan. 
they had an extremely interesting lifestyle for two young men. They traveled around the world. They've sent me all these pictures from the various places they've been in the USA and Ukraine. My favorite is well, the beach. The beach volleyball is one one favorite. That's in Denmark. But this is um, I, I contacted Marius the other week to find out um, what things were up to, and he sent me a picture of himself surfing. So he's enjoying life. And they've done rather well. Uh, in 2019, Jana Marius model made 838,000 euros uh, by placing over 100,000 uh, bets of the order of about 100 euros. So that's less than 1% profit per bet, um, but they've made so many bets that there's now very little luck involved. Um, what their models do actually is they just find bias, small biases in particular matches. It turns out, Germans are very pessimistic and Brazilians are very over optimistic about their teams. And those edges allow them to, to make money consistently on the betting, on the betting markets. And one thing I want to say, which is, I think, the most incredible um, out of all of this is that I started off talking about England and Denmark to give a solid example of a football team of two football teams. But there's no, no football involved in this, um, in this model. There's no knowledge of the relative strengths of the teams. There's just an understanding of probabilities. And when people work on football models, they do start to build in different um, things to do with the match, home advantage, away advantage, all of those types of things are built into different models. But it's not about knowing the form of the teams and the players that are playing. It's about finding biases in the odds. It's a purely statistical model. And then I started thinking, so when Jan and Marius went off to be multimillionaires and I was just left sitting in Uppsala doing my thing, but I started thinking like, um, you know, if who else is doing this? If Jan and Marius can be going around doing this, who else is up to these types of things? And I read this story about a, this is, this is a picture of the Happy Valley racetrack in Hong Kong. And apparently there was a genius mathematician. I read this story in um, Bloomberg magazine, a Bloomberg magazine, about the gambler who cracked the horse racing code. And Bill Benter, William Bentner, he did the impossible. Um, he wrote an algorithm that made a billion dollars um, on gambling on horses. It wasn't just him that used the algorithm, it was various other people, but they started to use this algorithm and um, this equation, and they made vast quantities of money. So I started to like look into a little bit of the background about this, and I found out something just incredible. He, he revealed after this, this revelation of the billion dollars came out after he'd finished and he'd retired and so on. But what was, really incredible was that he published an article, a scientific article, explaining how he was going to make all of this money. And he published this article in the beginning of the 90s, um, when he was really just starting out. He outlined exactly the approach he was going to make. He also did a talk where he explained in detail how everything worked. So that if there was any misunderstanding from the article and the talk, you can find up on YouTube. And he even, this is rather small, but he even published exactly the equation which I'm outlining um, earlier in the talk. And he showed that the equation worked over five years of data. He explained how you collected in the odds. What the work, what a lot of the work was, was collecting in the odds and the data to put into his model but he explained all of the details of how this worked. And it was then, going back to what I said right at the start about this secret society, that was the point when it struck me that it's a little bit like that, that it wasn't that William Bentner held secrets about what he did. It's just that he published openly the secrets, but he published them in mathematical journals. Now, any of you who are scientists will know that mathematicians and all scientists were obsessed with citations, how many times articles are cited. His article on racing was cited, I think, less than 100 times. So um, it really hadn't got a big impact, but it's sitting there for anybody who knows the language and understands the language to use and exploit. 
And I don't believe in conspiracy theories. I don't believe in Illuminati. I think there's a lot of evidence that such a thing doesn't exist. I believe the moon landing was real. I believe that uh, 5G isn't dangerous. I don't believe anything to do with QAnon or flat earth um, conspiracy theories. And the reason, there's many reasons we know that conspiracy theories aren't true. But one of the reasons we know we we know is that most of these conspiracy theories would take hundreds of people to do. And then just one person has to break down and reveal the conspiracy. And then everybody else knows about it. But it's very different in mathematics. And I call the, the 10, the Society of Mathematicians, who know the 10 equations, I call them 10. And they're very different. What they do is hidden in plain sight. So each of these equations and these are nine of the 10 equations I, I cover in the book. Each of these equations is written in many scientific articles. It's widely used and is there for anybody to see. But you have to put in the work to understand them. You have to know what they're about. And that's what I spent my time doing. I decided it was time to decode the 10 equations. I've told you the betting equation and how that works. But there are uh, nine more of them all of which can be used to better understand what happens um, both in the world and in your life. OK, so just to just to take this now. And so I said I'm going to do it as the big idea and I'm also going to think about it in your life. I just want to give a little bit of a feeling about how you should think about the betting equation in your own life. This is one model that some people have, have of the world. They think that one way of, of imagining yourself is thinking, well, if I think hard enough about a problem or I work hard enough on a particular thing, one day I'll come up with a big idea that will make me rich and successful. So the idea is you just think and you think and you think. Academics maybe spend a long time thinking about a particular problem or um, some you have this business idea or you want to have this business idea and you're, you're thinking about it. And um, what you do is you hope that one day, pang, you'll have this idea. But it's not like that. Most of the time, your ideas just don't work. So this is how you should really think about your ideas. You have an idea, doesn't work. Have another idea, doesn't work. Have another idea, doesn't work. And this just goes on until you've had lots of ideas and none of them seem to be working. But then hopefully one of them works. And this is a much better way to approach having ideas and thinking about the different things you do in life. If you have lots and lot, if you try lots and lots of different things, then one of them eventually will work out. It's a bit like running lots of different horse races, lots of different horses in lots of different races. And eventually one of those things will work out. And that's a much better approach than focusing on one particular big idea. And you can also think of this in your love life. You can imagine, I mean, I'm I'm a sort of happily married middle-aged man, so I'm not really this person to be handing out a load of advice about love lives. But I do know from younger people that it's pretty stressful with all this with Tinder and messaging all of these different people. And but in a way, that's what you have to stick out. You have to learn from all of the negative experiences you have. And one day you will have this positive experience where things finally work out. And I think that's a sort of philosophical approach, and it sounds a bit like a same kind of karmic approach to life. But really, it's um, really it's not just a karmic approach to life. It's a mathematically correct approach to life to have put lots of eggs in lots of different baskets. And again, going back to how um, well this is going, going to how um, social media and media use these types of algorithms. This is exactly what, for example, Netflix do to you every day. What they do is they try, they do something they call A-B testing, where they show you lots of different pictures for a TV series, and they see who clicks on which picture that's shown. And of course, you know which series this is, the Tiger King series. And they won't always show the same picture. They'll show lots of different pictures, and then they'll count up how many people are clicking on the different pictures, and they will show more often the picture that gets the most clicks, and that way, keep you watching Netflix. So they use those types of things. And all types of media companies use this type of approach in order to keep you clicking and keep you online. 
This is one last one. So I thought I'd get you back into the poll now. I know you've been listening to me for a while. So why moonshots aren't about risk taking? Got Elon Musk here. If the probability of a billion dollar moonshot is one in a hundred, then what is a fair bet on a moonshot? How much money, we'll go back to, you remember the definition of a fair bet? It's when the expected profit is zero. What's a fair bet on a moonshot? Can see the and and it's become very popular. I I, I think I'll, I can tell a little anecdote about this. I mean, I met a, um, a, a CEO of not a big company, but he, a reasonably big company. He had a hundred different employees, and he was flying around the world, building up his company as much as he could, and working very hard on this. And I think he'd had a hundred, he had actually, I think he had about 10 million invested. And he told me that he thought the success of his company was only one in 10. And at first I was astounded at this, that somebody would spend so much time building up a company when they knew that they could only exceed one time in 10. But the fact is, even if it's a one in a hundred chance, if you use a 10 million investment, and I see there's loads of people who've got this one right, really good work. If you put in a 10 million investment, then um, that will that's equivalent to an expected payoff of a million dollars. So the, um, the probability of a moonshot is worth uh, financing up to $10 million, um, which is reasonably surprising, but there's all these companies that have these these uh, investments of millions of, 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 of pounds and dollars, but they realize that, yeah, they'll probably never succeed. Um, expected payoff is, is that, um, as most of you have worked out. It's worth, uh, make, it's worth making for anything under than $10 million, roughly. Of course, you want to make a profit, so you want to go for a bit more than that. Okay, so next up, I'm going to take one more of, I'm going to take one and a half more of these, uh, these equations. Um, I want you to think about, I want you to look at the following uh, diagram. So this is Instagram. This is me on Instagram. I found to my embarrassment, I'm, I'm never on Instagram. I have pretty much no followers. I always bring this up. I have this, this picture both on Facebook and on Instagram of um, this is my daughter and my son. My daughter is now 17 and my son is 15 and they're both the same size as me. So this is a pretty old photo of me on Instagram. But anyway, what, what, what the point, the, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to say I'm the one in the middle. So you've got to start in the middle on this figure. I'm pointing with my mouse again. Um, but you have to start in the middle of this figure. And then what I want you to think about is do a random jump. You can think about this from your own Instagram account. Do a random jump to one person you follow. First, I ended up um, jumping off to Marcus, who I follow on, on Instagram. And then Marcus follows Lisa Zamuchi, who's a, uh, she's a football freestyler. Um, then she follows another football player who follows Kim Kardashian, who you'll see on the top left there, who follows Beyonce a little bit further down, who follows the American politician, AOC, who follows ProPublica, that's the P at the bottom there, um, which is a, a social justice website and news page who follows the gender section of the New York Times, who follows Jane Fonda, who follows someone else who I've now forgotten who it is, who follows Lenny Kravitz. We're now back up to Just Blow Me, who follows the Jackson 5, follows someone else in the pop industry. Then we move over to a whole bunch of footballers down on the right-hand side. The one with the family picture, that's Cristiano Ronaldo. Then we go up to Will Smith at the top there, um, at The Rock, Joe Biden, and we end up at the, that sort of blue uh, thing there, we actually end up with Billie Eilish. And I found out when I was doing this and doing my random jumping, Billie Eilish follows nobody. So that was the end of that uh, particular journey. But we can use that idea of randomly jumping between people to start to think about how Google and other social media sites see us. This is the thing. I, yeah, the point I wanted to make about this is if I do this jumping, even if I say, OK, I've ended up at Billie Eilish and I start randomly jumping again. If I do this jumping, I will never, ever end up at myself again, mainly because very few people follow me. 
may, maybe in an infinite time horizon, I'll end up as myself, but practically I will never end up jumping back into myself again, unfortunately. Okay, uh, now I'm gonna get you onto the poll again. And I want you to answer this question, not by, careful here, I don't want you to answer this question by who you think the, um, the biggest influencer is. I want you to look at the network on the left. The network contains Joe Biden, The Rock uh, Johnson, Will Smith, Beyonce, and Kim Kardashian. And I want you to jump, I want you to think about if you jumped randomly between them in exactly the way I did before. So if you started on Joe Biden, for example, Joe Biden can either jump to Kim or um, can jump to The Rock. The Rock can jump to Joe Biden or can jump to Kim Kardashian. Kim Kardashian can jump to Will Smith or Beyonce. Beyonce and Will Smith can jump between each other. So the arrows show who the, you can jump between. So I see nobody's voting for Joe Biden. <laughs> In this case, no one's voting for Joe Biden. Will Smith and Beyonce. You, so you've, you've got the basic idea here. You've got the idea that The Rock and Kim Kardashian are the biggest influencers on this network because everybody follows them and they don't, and not everybody follows the other, other people there. So it's between the two of them. Oh, I'm interested. So Kim Kardashian, when I, when I first put up who's the biggest influencer, I noticed Kim Kardashian just shot off before anyone had looked at the problem. They thought, yeah, wait a minute, it must be Kim Kardashian. I think The Rock, I think actually in real Instagram, The Rock Johnson and, and Kim Kardashian are about as big as each other. Anyway, you seem to have landed on Kim Kardashian in the end. The Rock went ahead for a while, but has now fallen back and Kim Kardashian has won it. Right, let's do the maths and find out. So who's the biggest influencer? Okay, here is how we represent this as a mathematical problem. So if you look in, we've got rows and columns here. And if you look in the column with Joe Biden, and Joe Biden's column has zero, half, half, zero, zero. And that's because Joe, he can either hop to The Rock or he can hop to Kim Kardashian. There's a 50-50 chance of, of both of those hops. The Rock, half of the time he can hop to Joe Biden, half of the time to Kim Kardashian. And the others have thirds in them. And that's because they can hop to three different people. So Kim Kardashian can either hop to The Rock um, she can hop to Will Smith or she can hop to Beyonce and so on. I haven't said so much about Will Smith and Beyonce, but the pattern's the same. And this is how we set up the, the social network we've got as a mathematical problem in something we call a matrix. We call this the matrix A. And we then do the following. Well, let's, let's just illustrate this. We start on Joe Biden and first we hop half of Joe Biden to Kim Kardashian and half of Joe Biden to The Rock. That's doing it graphically. And doing it mathematically, we do the following thing. We take the matrix that I showed you before and we multiply it by a vector with a one in it. So the one at the top, the vector is the, is the single column. You see there's the matrix where you have a five by five. Think of it as an Excel spreadsheet. Then you have a dot and then you have the vector with the one zero zero zero. And this says at the start, everything is Joe, everyone is Joe Biden. We're on Joe Biden. And then with probability, then we find the result. What we do is we, we take the matrix and we multiply it by the vector. Since I can't use my, my arrows, I, I can't really show you how you do the calculation, but you end up mathematically with half of us on the rock and half on Kim Kardashian, just like when I made my first hop. Then I just keep doing this. So next step I do is I take the rock and he hops, we hop away from the rock. And you see some of the rock has landed back on Biden and some of it's gone to Kim Kardashian. Now I take Kim and she's gonna hop in three directions. So she splits in thirds and one third of her weight goes to the rock, one third goes to Will Smith and one third goes to Beyonce. Um, and mathematically, that looks like this, that we multiply again, and now we have a quarter on Biden, a sixth on The Rock, a quarter on um, Kim Kardashian, and so on. And we just keep on doing this. We keep taking the red dots that I've been doing, and we keep multiplying by the matrix, matrix and we keep hopping around. And that's uh, one more step. We've now got six over 72. It's now it's actually 50-50 between The Rock and um, Kim Kardashian. 
Um, and finally, we actually end up with the following solution. And this is where it's, it's quite nice, actually. You can find a vector here. If you look at the vector, which has 8 over 60, 16 over 16, 60, 18 over 60, 9 over 60, 9 over 60. When you multiply that by the matrix, it just gives the same result as before. And that's shown algebraically at the bottom with the equation A dot rho infinity equals rho infinity. Rho infinity is what happens if you just keep hopping for an infinite amount of time, who will you end up most on? And you'll find now that you got it right. Well, 52% of you voted for the rock, uh, for Kim Kardashian as the most popular individual. And she is because 18 out of 60 of the times, if you're just jumping around at random, um, Kim Kardashian will be chosen slightly ahead of the rock who's 16 out of 60. Joe Biden is a long, long way down. Well, not a long way down. He's half as popular as the rock. And what's the point of all this? Well, the point is that this is the algorithm used by Google in order to rank. It's called their page rank algorithm. And it's used to rank how important different people are on the internet. And what the result of this all is, is that we have a very exaggerated um, view of society. So some people, the influencers, become really, really popular and they're seen all of the time. They become, they go up and up all, all the search results, and there's a lot of interest around them. And Google and then Instagram and Facebook, who all use similar variations of this algorithm, they enhance that over and over again. And it also happens on Amazon with the with the purchase of different items. And it also happens, and this I think is one of the most important things. It's one thing to say it's about celebrities, but it also happens on the news. So stories like just now COVID, um, the Brexit, Trump. I, I was going to try and do a whole talk without mentioning any of those three things, but I'm just going to mention them once. They become exaggerated stories. They're, of course, important stories, but there's lots of stories going on in the world. But there becomes a feedback where certain stories take off. And that happens in all parts of our society because of the way social media is set up. Um, and again, a lot of this originally comes from very old mathematics. You can actually go all the way back and find the influencer equation in the work of, um, it was actually first discussed by Perrin and Frobenius, two separate mathematicians who discovered this. You can find the influencer equation used by them in 100 year old documents. Um, you can find it, and even in Chinese mathematics, some similar things are done. Gaussian elimination, it's called, and the there I've, I've shown a text from the nine chapters of the mathematical art, which is an old Chinese mathematics thing. And I've also shown from, from Gauss and so on. Um, and what's quite interesting here is that Google have a patent over this mathematics. So if you go into the patent that Larry Page wrote for um, uh, Google's algorithm, you actually find the influencer equation right there. Now, I realize I've um, used quite a lot of my time and I haven't quite got through everything. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you Google are very rich. You know that. I'm just going to tell you briefly that YouTube have their own algorithm. That algorithm is based on um, what I call the learning equation. And it's really a derivative where you try and hone in on a target. YouTube had a big problem in 2014, 15, because people would just go in there and they'd watch like one or two videos, then they'd leave. And what they needed is they needed an algorithm which kept people there and found things for them to watch. And they did that. If you want, you can ask me about this in the questions. They did that using um, what I call the learning equation, which they put into a neural network to optimize watch time. And they massively increased how long we, we, um, we spend watching YouTube using this optimization algorithm. I'm going to skip over that because I want, to, I want to get over to a little bit of a positive thing. And I want to say that you can take back control of your life. And I have, these are my role models in this. These are two of my students, Michaela and Lena. And Michaela and Lena came to me a bit like Jan and Marius, actually. And they wanted to do a project to understand their Instagram feed. They wanted to know what Instagram was prioritizing in what they, what they were being shown. They... Um, both use Instagram, and they'd also read that 
uh, many influencers in Sweden, this is a Swedish influencer, they were complaining because Instagram apparently wasn't prioritizing them as much as before. And what it was, this was very bra brave of Mikhail and Lena actually, what they did is that they decided they were only going to open Instagram once a day. And that once a day, they were going to make a list of what types of posts were shown to them. Was it posts from friends and family? Was it posts from influencers and so on? Which type of posts were most often shown to them on Instagram? Was it posts from companies? And they came up with the following findings by doing this. I mean, once a day is, you know, I mean, I think most, most young people open Instagram once every two minutes. So once a day was pretty impressive. And what they found was the following. What they did is that they, they made a mathematical model which randomizes, which imagined that they had a random ordering of the posts on their feed. And they found that friends and relatives were highly prioritized on Instagram. They also found that companies who they followed were vastly deprioritized. And that's very interesting for companies who are trying to pursue social media strategies because they're becoming deprioritized on people's Instagram feeds. Adverts are prioritized, of course, but non-sponsored companies are deprioritized. But they also found, and I thought this was quite interesting, uh, that influencers were unaffected. So that's shown in this graph here that a random ordering of influencers, shown as this kind of normal curve, compared to, to the dotted line here, um, shows that influencers were were unaffected in this in this thing. So the influencers couldn't complain as much as they, they could. And I really like this quote from Lena because what she actually found is that the whole process of um, looking at her Instagram in this way improved her relationship to it. So she said, instead of scrolling down all of the time, time after time after time, trying to find something interesting, she I stop after I've seen a few posts from friends I know that further down, it's just boring stuff. So reverse engineering these algorithms and, and looking at them yourself um, doesn't require that advanced mathematics, but it does give you quite a lot of, of insight. Um, again, you can ask me about some of the other equations. I've, I've been thinking about the reward equation to more balanced approach from social media. I talked a little bit about that on Radio 4, more or less. Um, you can also think about the learning equation but I want to skip that because I want to make one last important point. There is no Illuminati and, and the Da Vinci Code, although it's a fun book and a nice film, is just fiction. But it does make you think there's just so many different sides to 10, the society where mathematics is in our life. There's a side where we represented by Mikhail and, and Lena. They're both off to work now as upper secondary school teachers and hopefully tell the students that they have about what they found out when they looked at the mathematics of Instagram. And then there's, of course, Marius, who's off there surfing and enjoying the lifestyle of being a professional better. That's one side of, of 10. Then there's another side. There's the personal development. I, I find it really amusing that, that uh, uh, Alan Lane wanted to put me on the cover of a book. But um, uh, there is that side of it where there's the self-help side of it that you can improve as a person, not necessarily by going deep into the equations, but thinking more in that mathematical way. And then there's this very serious side of it where a few equations have revolutionized certain companies. I've put up betting companies, finance companies. Um, I haven't talked much about football here, but that's that's the FSM at the bottom. There. That's the logo for Fenway Sports Management who are in Liverpool who used analytics to revolutionize their game. The companies that are using these equations, they are learning things about their businesses and they are making incredible amounts of money. And that brings me to this slide where um, I get a little bit moralistic. I mean, I think I feel guilty because I can see myself in this picture and I don't think I look so different when I'm sort of smiling and telling you all these things. I maybe don't look so different from these guys. And these guys, they make so much money. I took this headline from Time magazine recently. The top 1% of Americans have taken 50 trillion from the bottom 90%. I thought this funny, they write that, and that's made US less secure. Yes, of course it's made the US less secure. I mean, this vast inequality 
where certain people, because they've applied the right equations and have the right people working for them who know these things can make so much money, yeah, that's going to make society less secure. It, it's very difficult to see how that is a really good thing, even though maybe they're spending money on, on charity in a way. Having an unbal unbalance in society in that way, and some of it has to be attributed to us mathematicians, um, makes me feel really guilty. Um, and I suppose, but then there's the positive side. There's the way that maths can be used. And these are some of we, we've had for the last couple of years, we haven't had it this year, but the last couple of years, we've had a mathematics for social activism workshop. And there I've, I've heard talks, um, for example, from Adam Hill, who's looked at um, Cambridge Analytica and the uh, networks of finances across the world. Um, Nicole Nisbet, who works within the, she's on the top right, she works um, within the Houses of Parliament, looking at how parliamenticians can better communicate with people outside. Victoria Spicer at the bottom um, left hand, she's been looking at Twitter interactions in Ukraine and Russia. And then at the bottom right, there's um, Mira Bernstein, who's looking at gerrymandering, how politicians split up different, different areas. So there's lots of these ways in which you can use mathematics in an incredibly positive way. And I see that the hour is ticked by. So I'll answer the final question. Is there a secret society that controls the world? Well, yes, there is. And you should join today and make a difference for the better. Thank you very much.